I don't like how uh, how hostile it really feels right now um, between the left and the right, because ultimately, whether on the left or the right, there's something that's so much more important, and it's Christ. Most of the things that we talk about are really pre-political in the sense that the definition of the family or gender or when life starts inside the womb. Yes, those have become controversial political issues, but for the Christian, those are really Genesis 1 issues. We're talking about foundational theological issues. So many of us are, are so inspired uh, watching you on television and seeing the, the convictions and the character with which you carry yourself. Uh, did you always have an interest in politics and in the media, or was there a time when, when you felt this real calling to move into those places? So it's a great question. I had this like natural love for politics from a very young age. It may sound a little peculiar, but I was this like eight-year-old on the playground who was doing cheers for Bob Dole during the 1996 <laughs> election. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but my like my heart just drew me to politics. And I, I look. I don't come from a political family, Kirk. Like, yes, they have viewpoints. They are conservative. They talk about politics at the dinner table. But really, for me, it was riding my dad's truck, hearing this guy named Rush Limbaugh, um, and just being really inspired and motivated. So, for whatever reason, God put politics on my heart from a very, very young age. Well, it's one of those subjects that just affects everything. It's really how we live. It's the quality of life. It's how we treat other people. And uh, faith is so closely connected with politics because that's how we live out our faith and the way that we treat other people. So that, that makes sense. And it seems like you have really been on the fast track. I mean, you started and you were an intern in the White House and then you're the press secretary of the White House. And then you're a production assistant and now a national television host. Um, that's really amazing. Uh, tell us about your journey to the White House. Yeah, you know, it is, you're, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, from intern to press secretary and just over 10 years, I mean, it shocked me that that was the plan that God had for my life because I was just this young kid in the back corner um, of the briefing room watching Dana Perino do a briefing. I was in college at the time. And then I go to intern at Fox News and then um, ultimately, you know, become a host at Fox News. And it's funny, you know, along the path, you know, this 10 year journey to the podium, you know, there were doors that were shut. Um, and I used to think, why, God, I know I'm qualified for this. I know I can do this. But, you know, every door that was shut um, was opening another little door that had this, you know, kind of unlikely path to the podium from being on a CNN set, which is where I was in 2016, to the RNC, to the Trump campaign, and then ultimate, ultimately getting the call from President Trump to come be his press secretary. But, you know, it was not an easy path. It's not a spot I glided into. It's a spot where, you know, there were doors slammed in my face, but they were slammed for a reason. And I think um, when you achieve God's purpose that he has for your life, a lot of times you can look back and like a constellation of stars, you just just say, oh, that's why that was shut. Oh, that's why that yeah. door was open. Okay, now I understand. I think so many conservatives look at mainstream media today and they see an agenda and a bias behind so many things, so many stories that they see and individuals who are trying to push that. And as ambassadors from heaven, as Christians who have a message of grace that we want to get out to the world and we want the world to be reconciled to God, do you feel sort of like this covert ambassador from heaven or do you feel like, no, I'm just Kaylee doing my job. This is what I believe and, uh, and, and I don't have an agenda. Or is it okay to say, no, we actually yes. do and it's a good agenda? you know, we as Christians, one of the keys is when we share our points um, to do so with gentleness um, and to do so with love and with compassion. You know, I don't agree with all of the political rhetoric out there. I don't like a lot of the political rhetoric out there. Um, it gets too caustic. I don't like how uh, how hostile it really feels right now um, between the left and the right, because ultimately, whether on the left or the right, there's something that's so much more important and it's Christ. Um, and if we as Christians can bring gentleness to our with our message, as, as Alan Combs said to me, don't fight fire with fire, fight fire with water. I think that's wise advice. Um, and if we can communicate the truth with a gentle heart, it'll go a long way. What is actually a, a worldview and why is it so important for us to have one? Yeah, my dad always used to say growing up, like, everyone has a worldview. And I was like, what's this worldview thing? Like, he keeps talking about. Um, and it really is the lens through which you see the world. And I, it crystallized for me, especially when I went overseas to Oxford. You know, I was in a very liberal institution. I, I enjoyed my time there. I grew there. I credit, you know, being able to... Uh, argue in a way that is um, like intellectual and, and makes sense to my time at Oxford, because I really got to dig into um, kind of the art of, of argumentation. Um, 
But, you know, as I went there, I was surrounded by people with very different worldviews, very different viewpoints. Um, and, you know, for me, knowing that my viewpoint always funneled through the viewpoint of Jesus Christ, um, it, it really helped me um, to to keep my principles, to stay firm. I know a lot of parents worry about their kids going off to college, but if you've put them in the church um, and, and put within them the worldview that I had and that I grew up with, you don't need to worry when they go off to college. Of course, keep an eye on them and check on them, but um, it really helps to keep you centered and grounded. So you've really become known as a cultural commentator. You're a millennial who's not afraid to talk about tough topics from a biblical perspective. What got you interested in that line of work? I have been at least vaguely interested in politics for a very long time. I mean, one of my first and most vivid memories is the Bush Gore election and staying up as late as my parents would let me to make sure that my candidate won. And so I've always been kind of interested in what's going on on a political and cultural level. I decided during the 2016 election, because I lived in a college town, that I kind of had a cool opportunity. I started to reach out to sororities uh, at the University of Georgia, asking if it was okay if I could just come to their chapter meetings, give a presentation that I had created on my own about why they should vote. It was nonpartisan. But I just wanted to encourage them to get involved in the political process, to care about the things that were going on. And then I started getting emails from these students asking for you know, my perspective on different topics. And that's when I started a blog, actually, in 2016 called The Conservative Millennial, which then it was kind of known that that was like a paradoxical phrase. It was a little bit ironic. And so started making those videos. And then after a year or so of that, that turned into kind of a full-time career. I started working at The Blaze in 2017. Then by 2018, I started my podcast, Relatable. And really all this time, it's just kind of been growing organically. So yeah, it's been fun. And it's been a, it's been a crazy journey over the past few years. Well, I think that you are uniquely gifted to talk about these things because a, a lot of people talk about it at home, in private, with their spouse or with their kids where there's no opposition, but you actually go right to the front lines in your podcast and on the news. Do you think that you were just made for this kind of a job? I mean, some people would say, I just, I don't like to argue and fight, but you don't really argue and fight. You're talking about these things with a lot of confidence. Um, is that hard? Is that challenging? Or does that come really natural? It's definitely challenging. I think it's both. But do I enjoy also being on the front lines and talking about these controversial issues? Yes, of course. There's a part of me that gets a lot of energy from that. Now, I don't like being intentionally inflammatory, or provocative, or anything like that. I don't want to cause controversy. But the things today that are considered controversial, my main argument is that for the Christian, they're not. Um, most of the things that we talk about are really pre-political in the sense that the definition of the family or gender or when life starts inside the womb, yes, those have become controversial political issues. But for the Christian, those are really Genesis 1 issues. We're talking about foundational theological issues. So what I'm trying to do, albeit very imperfectly as a fallible person, is to talk about how, how do these pre-political issues, these really biblical issues, inform how we look at what are now, you know, policies and culture war issues and things like that. How do you handle the backlash from people who disagree with you, that begin to, to, to use terms to describe you that is everything you don't want to be described as, as yeah. a Christian, as a follower of Christ? How do you handle that? It, you know, it is difficult. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, you know, I love it when people call me names and it just, you know, slides right off me like Teflon. That's not the case. I mean, there are some things that, of course, hurt my feelings, but you do have to, you have to have, uh, you know, tough skin. And it does kind of build up over time, kind of like a callus, like it protects you from taking all of those things personally. I think obviously, the biggest thing that helps is knowing who I am in Christ and knowing that he fully knows my heart and my intentions. And when they're wrong, hopefully the Holy Spirit, you know, convicts me of those things. But I also have people in my life who I know will be honest with me. Having my family, having my friends who I know will tell me the truth about what I'm saying, how it's coming across, um, you know, how I'm conducting my business, whatever it is, that helps me filter out the comments from other people that I know are not true, who don't really know me, who no matter what I say, they're going to call me all sorts of names. So I have to remember whose opinion really matters and that other people who don't know me at all, 
um, and who just want to, you know, malign me and, and slander me, that really their opinion doesn't define me, doesn't shape who I am, and it doesn't determine my future either. That's a great lesson for all of us, no matter what we do for a living. How do you form a biblical perspective on a subject that the Bible doesn't speak specifically to? For instance, what kind of movies should I watch? What kind of music should I listen to? Who should I vote for uh, when it comes to my school board uh, or my, you know, my governor's race or yeah. the presidential election? Or what you know, gender expression is really all about when we don't find those terms in the scriptures themselves? Well, we do find the basic principles of all of those things in scripture themselves. So of course, we're not going to see the word gender expression or gender identity, just for example, in the Bible. But we do see in the first chapter of the Bible that God made the male and female. And so right there from the very beginning, I can look at the creation order and I can see that that creation order is reiterated throughout scripture. It's repeated by Jesus himself in Matthew 19 when he says, haven't you heard that a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh? And of course, we see the commandment uh, in, the t in the Ten Commandments that we are to honor our father and mother. And so even though we don't see terms like gender identity or gay marriage or transgender or things like that, um, we see what God says is. That's actually something, um, an error that I see a lot of people make that says, well, Jesus never said this word or the Bible doesn't say abortion. And so that means that it's fine. So it's kind of an argument from absence because the Bible doesn't use our modern political or cultural terms. That means that Jesus was fine with it. But we're not supposed to read the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say specifically that we can't do so we can see what we can get away with? Rather, mm. we look at the Bible and say, but what does it say? How do we positively define these things? God positively defines marriages between a man and a woman. He positively defines gender and sex as really the same categories, male and female. So I don't need to look for the modern terminology in an ancient text. The principles are all there.